Okay, good morning, everyone. So let's review where we are in our study of the fine and hyperfine structure of the hydrogen atom. Okay, so the hydrogen atom, I'm going to make some columns here where we have states and we have the energies. And then on the right, I'll be writing some comments. Okay, and so first we have zero with order. And so at zero with order, we write our states with a principal quantum number and an orbital angular momentum and a Z component for it, right? And so when we first did the hydrogen atom, we just ignored the spin of the electron. And then we found the completely unperturbed energies which are negative 13.6 electron volts, and then one over n squared, where remember n starts at one. Okay, and so there's no dependence here on L for the energies, or m sub L, or if we put in the spin on m sub s the Z component of the spin of the electron. So that was at zero with order. And then we did fine structure. And so fine structure involves, uh, what we're really doing here was we're adding the effects of the electron spin and associated relativistic effects that have the same order of magnitude. Okay, and so now our states are labeled by N, L, and the total angular momentum, including the spin, and then the Z component. Okay, and that was the basis in which degenerate perturbation theory works, because the corrections to the energy are diagonal in that basis. Okay, and they're given by, and I'm writing everything normalized to 13.6 to electron volts. And then it turns out to be proportional to the fine structure constant squared over n cubed. And then there's a factor of three over four n minus one over j plus one half. Okay, and this is for j equals l plus or minus one half, except if l is zero, then only j equals one half is allowed. But now there's no dependence on L or on M sub J. So the, when we say no dependence, what we're really saying here is that there's a degeneracy, a remaining degeneracy in the energies. And so this was a sort of a remarkable formula because remember it came from three separate terms and the three separate terms then miraculously combined back into a relatively simple thing. Okay, and then to do the hyperfine, we added in the effect of proton spin. And so that's the hyperfine. And so now our states are labeled by still the principal quantum number, orbital angular momentum, the sum of the orbital and the spin, which we call J, and then the total total angular momentum, including the proton spin and its Z component. So notice we're using a basis that's the total angular momentum basis. So our states are no longer labeled by M sub L or M sub J. Instead, they're just labeled by the total angular momenta, the angular momenta of each type, the uh, L squared sort of quantum number, and then the Z component. Okay, and then again, doing first order perturbation theory, we found the corrections to the energy looked like pulling out the energy factor, 13.6 electron volts. And again, it was alpha squared over n cubed, but now it was multiplied by a factor having to do with the proton spin. And that number is a dimensionless number that turns out to be about 0.00304. And the reason it's that small is because the proton's heavy. And then multiplying it was 
plus or minus one divided by two L plus one times F plus one half. That's what we found. Again, remarkably simple compared to the intermediate expressions that we needed to do to get it. And this is for F equals J plus or minus one half. When we add a spin one half to another angular momentum, in this case, the J angular momentum, it can only go up or down by one half unit. And then in the end, there's no dependence on M sub F. So that's the remaining degeneracy. Okay, and so that remaining degeneracy, which is uh, completely robust, as long as you don't put this thing within a magnetic field, for example, because that would pick out a special direction, is going to be 2f plus 1, because that's the number of different values of m sub f there are. So one thing to note is that each eigenstate of f, since each eigenstate of f is getting a correction, that if you look at the denominator here is, has a, a 2f plus 1 in the denominator when I get rid of the 1 half factor, and is multiplied by 2f plus 1, and one of them is positive and the other one's negative, that means the average energy shift from hyperfine is zero. Okay, so let me write that down. Since delta E hyperfine is proportional to one over two F plus one, that is this factor right here. Okay, with opposite signs, That's this factor in the numerator. And there's two F plus one of them right here. That means the average splitting is zero. The average of the splittings is zero. So um, average energy of each hyperfine splitting. is zero for a given J. Okay, so that's where we, where we are. And now I have to tell you that there's actually a, an effect that's larger than hyperfine or sometimes larger than hyperfine, which isn't, cal which isn't uh, included in this. And so these effects are both first order and perturbation theory. We just took expectation values of the perturbation Hamiltonian in each case to get one of those. But now you could worry about second order in perturbation theory. And you might naively think, oh, that's gonna be really, really small because then I'm gonna add more powers of the fine structure constant for each order of perturbation theory. And the fine structure constant is small, but it turns out there is an accidental enhancement of that. And so that's called the Lamb shift. So, However, there is a second order effect, second order in perturbation theory, which happens to be larger than hyperfine. Another way of thinking about it is that hyperfine is accidentally very small because of a large proton mass. Okay, so that's why this thing can compete. And so this is called the Lamb shift. And we're not gonna be able to explore this in detail. In the end, I'm just gonna write down a formula for you that is approximately true, but let me try to explain where this comes from. So Delta E Lamb is going to be a second order in perturbation theory. So we're gonna be summing over intermediate states. So let me write here a sum over n prime, l prime, and j prime. But I'm also going to be summing over something else. I'm going to leave the under the summation sign here for a moment. So let me write down the matrix elements that are going to 
that are going to come in here. So the state, the intermediate states are n prime, l prime, j prime. And in these states, there is also going to be a photon. So the photon is characterized by some angular momentum omega, some propagation direction k hat, and some polarization direct direction epsilon hat. So epsilon hat is a unit vector, so is k hat. And so we need to sum over those as well. So that's why this is hard. Then there's an interaction Hamiltonian, which I'll write down. And then there's NLJ for the state that we're computing the correction to. And then we have to divide by, remember it's the energy difference that goes in the denominator. So it's the unperturbed energy of the state N minus the unperturbed energy of the state N prime minus the energy of the photon also contributes and that's h bar omega that's the energy of a photon in quantum mechanics okay so really that's just the general formula for second order and perturbation theory but there's a lot of complication hidden in that one complication is our interaction hamiltonian is minus e over c a three-dimensional integral of basically the current associated with the electron dotted into the vector potential of the photon. Okay, so this is vector potential for photon operator. That's an operator and J is also an operator. It's the current density operator for the photon, not for the photon, for the electron, sorry. Okay, so let me just be, let me, we're not going to go through this in detail, but let me write down what this state means. My state n prime, l prime, j prime, omega, k hat, epsilon hat, is in words, a state with a photon of frequency omega or angular frequency omega, wave vector k hat, or that's the wave vector direction, I guess. So I should say the wave vector is k is k hat times omega or k hat c over omega. And then the polarization is epsilon hat. Okay, and the hydrogen atom in a different energy level. So that's the state N prime, L prime, J prime. And then the state NLJ is the state that we're computing the energy correction to. That's a state with no photons. OK, and so somehow this operator here is creating and destroying photons. All right, so this is, I'll just write down, it's very hard. This took a long time to work out and get straight. One of the reasons it's hard is because when I wrote a sum over omegas, omega is a continuous quantity. And so this is actually an integral that you have to do. Professor? Yes? I'm sorry, if I'm not interrupting, where you wrote k equals k hat times omega, is that a c over the omega? Yeah. Uh, I okay, so it's omega. Well, so omega over C, I guess. I'm forgetting my, yeah. It doesn't matter because we're not gonna actually evaluate this anyway. Okay. 
So, so the thing I wanted to mention here is, is instead of doing a sum over omega, we're actually gonna have to integrate over it because it's a continuous thing. And when you try to do that integral, you find out a nasty surprise, which is it diverges. It's not even finite, which sounds like a, a very bad thing. And it took a long time to sort out in quantum field theory how to deal with this. One way to represent what's going on is you've got your electron that's just moving along, minding its own business. Actually, it's in the Coulomb field of the proton, but it's emitting a photon. This is your photon. And then reabsorbing it. And when you calculate the probability amplitude for that to happen, which involves two insertions of the interaction Hamiltonian, one way of thinking about that is here's your interaction Hamiltonian, but when it appears here, it appears in the sum squared. That's why there are two of them. Okay, and so this diverges and the correct way to deal with this is you need a cutoff of the frequency omega. And so what you're really supposed to do is integrate from zero up to omega max, which is some very large value. And then you have to renormalize it by taking care of the dependence on omega max. This is the magic of what's called renormalization theory. You renormalize the mass of the electron to remove the contribution, which looks like it's going to be a divergence. So when you do the integral, you get something like a logarithm of omega max over the mass of the electron. That looks like, oh, I should really take omega max to infinity and then that logarithm will blow up. But the idea is that you can absorb that dependence into the mass of the electron and then everything's okay. It's not at all obvious that everything's okay, but it turns out to be okay. Okay, so let me just tell you what the final results of doing this, which took some heroic calculations. And it sort of divides into two main cases, similar to what we got for our um, hyperfine case. So for L equals zero states, it turns out the Lamb shift correction to the energy is alpha cubed over n cubed times a Rydberg times something we can call k lamb, which is about 6.5. The actual formula for it is very complicated and it actually depends on n a little bit, not very strongly. Okay, but this competes with hyperfine because it doesn't have a one over m proton in it. On the other hand, it does have one extra power of the fine structure constant. That's telling you that you're doing one order more in perturbation theory. Um, but the, the, the one extra fine structure constant is compensated for by two facts. One is that you have a 6.5 here, which is kind of a large-ish number. And the other is you don't have a one over m proton. Okay, and then for L equals L non equals zero states, it's much smaller. It's still non zero, but I'm just going to write here uh, it's proportional to the fine structure constant cubed over n cubed times a Rydberg times a number that's much smaller but non zero. And so for your homework this week, uh, I'm encouraging you to forget that part. So you do not have to include this, uh, but you should include this. All right, so now we can summarize what I, all of these effects on the hydrogen atom. 
So let's first do the case of um, n equals one, n equals one. So what we found there is basically we just had one state in the unperturbed case because if n is one, then L is zero. And if L is zero, then the total angular momentum is one half. Okay, and then, so these are the N, L, J states. And then F can be one half plus one half, which is one, or one half minus one half, which is zero. Okay, so if we make them, so these quantum numbers, we usually write in spectroscopic notation as one for N, and s for zero for l being zero and one half for j and so if you draw the energy levels the f equals one is up here the f equals zero is down here together these form the one s one half multiplet and this was the 21 centimeter line because the splitting was it turned out um five point, what was it? I have to look back in my notes here. 5.88 times 10 to the minus six electron volts. Okay, so that's all there is for the n equals one state. This is at zeroth order, it's negative one Rydberg, but then these two states get split apart. Okay, and now we can do the summary of everything that's going on for the n equals two level. I'm sorry, Professor, could you just scroll up just a little bit? I was still behind. Thank you. Okay. So for the n equals two level, let's first figure out what all of our states are before we put in the hyperfine. So we've got L can be zero, which means that J is one half. Okay, and so this is gonna be the two S one half multiplet. L can be one, and then J can still be one half because I can, I can have my spin, when I add the spin in the orbital, one half adding a spin one half can give me one halves or three halves. So this is the two P one half multiplet. And then there's the L equals one, J equals three halves which is the two P three halves multiply. Okay, and then to each of those, I add in the F. And so this had an F equals one and an F equals zero. This also has an F equals one and an F equals zero because I'm adding proton spin one half to the J equals one half. And then this splits into F equals two or F equals one. Because when I add when I add angular momentum three halves to a spin one half, it either goes up or down by one half unit. So let's map out where all these things are, and I'll start. I'll leave some space here and put first the two s one half. Okay, and the f equals one. The larger f is always higher in energy. And then if you plug in, what's the splitting between those from the hyperfine, this is a hyperfine splitting of 7.35 times 10 to the minus seven electron volts. Okay, that's the analog of the 21 centimeter line for the n equals one level, but it's a much smaller energy splitting because you're dividing by n cubed, which is eight. Okay, and so this is the two S one half level. And so let me draw here the average of those, which is skewed more towards the F equals one because there's three of those and only one of the F equals zero states. Okay, and then there's the lamb shift. The lamb shift is going to be uh, smaller is going to put you smaller when you go to the 2p one half level. And the reason for that is 
just if we go back up here, it's because this is a much larger number for L equals zero than for L not equals zero. So now we can draw the two P one half levels. And again, the dashed line is supposed to represent the average of the two. Let me do that in black. So we have an F equals one level again, and we have below it, three times below the dotted line is F equals zero. Okay, and this is our two P one half. Okay, and so first of all, this lamb shift by which the L equals zero state is higher, turns out to be when you plug in the numbers, 4.375 times 10 to the minus six electron volts. And then this hyperfine splitting between these states is 2.45 times 10 to the minus seven electron volts hyperfine. Okay, so the lamb shift and the hyperfine is the only thing that affects those. But now if I look at the two P3 halves, that has a different value of J. And remember the fine structure only, to, only cared about what J was. And so this, there, between all the states that I've drawn so far and the two P3 halves, there's this much larger, um, much larger splitting from the fine. So I'm gonna put up here a dashed line for the average of those states. This is the fine structure, which is much larger, 4.5283 something, something, something times 10 to the minus five electron volts is the fine structure. Right, this up here, this is our two P three halves level. And then that's split into the F equals two and F equals one. I didn't leave enough space there, but that, hy that hyperfine splitting is 0 0.98 times 10 to the minus seven electron volts. Okay, so that's map mapping out all the different splittings, which divide into fine, hyperfine, and the lamb shift. The lamb shift to first approximation just splits apart anything with L equals zero. That means anything that's in this notation in S state from the corresponding P state. Okay, and so for homework, you get to do this for N equals three, just to familiarize yourself with all the effects. Okay, and when you do this for homework, you should not try to, as the homework problem states, you should not try to do this exactly to scale. You should instead try to do it qualitatively so that you leave sort of larger space for fine structure. But uh, if, I, if I really were to try to do this to scale, this would be uh, ridiculously because this in terms of this, this is what, uh, 450 times that. So if I drew it to scale, nothing would be leg legible, but we just want to do it indicating qualitatively which are larger and which are smaller effects. Okay, and by the way, everything that I've drawn here, before I do all these splittings, so all of these have unperturbed energy, which is minus a Rydberg times one quarter, that's one over N squared, which is about minus 3.4 electron volts. So on that scale, these are very, very tiny effects, but you can measure them because you can see the photons that are emitted and absorbed when you go in transitions between these states. Okay, any questions on that before we move to a totally different topic? Professor Foster? Yes. 
So basically, is it like, this is the magnetic field that's being applied is splitting up the levels in, within the atom. Is that what's happening? So we're not applying any magnetic field here. Okay. There, there are magnetic fields having to do with the spins of the proton and the electron. And that is, that is responsible for part of the splitting, but not all of the splitting. Part of the splitting, for example, from fine structure didn't have anything to do with magnetic fields. It had to do with relativistic effects. And part of it had to do with this Darwin term that again, had nothing to do with magnetic fields. But in any case, we're, we're, not, we're not imposing any magnetic field on this. Actually, that's your second homework problem for this week. So by the way, maybe this is a good time for me to say something about that. The, sec the fifth homework set is now on the web page. That is the last one before your first midterm. And therefore I have attempted to make it be not as time consuming. Um, one, of the one of the things, you well, one of the problems is just to, as I said, to redo all of this for the N equals three level, which is just a, a way of getting you to uh, understand the formulas and how they are applied, but should be just a matter of plugging in numbers. And then the second problem you get to do is ignore the hyperfine effects and figure out what is the effect of putting a weak magnetic field that we do apply a weak magnetic field to uh, the hydrogen atom and see what happens to the state. So by weak magnetic field, I mean it's weaker than the effects of the fine structure, but stronger than the effects of the hyperfine, which again, you, you should just completely ignore when you're doing that problem. Okay, so homework one is do this for n equals three. Homework two is apply a weak B field externally and when you apply a weak B field externally, that picks out a special direction. And so that changes um, what your states are. All right, any, any other questions? All right, so our next topic that we're going to move on to is to remedy a slight cheat that we made when we did the helium atom a while ago. And that is we ignored the fact that the helium atom contains two electrons and the two electrons are identical. And it turns out everything we did was right, but it's not obvious that it was right. And so at the end of this sort of discussion of identical particles, we're gonna to wanna to understand why it was okay to cheat the way we cheated and why that cheat does not work when you talk about excited states of helium, it only works for the ground state. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about identical particles in quantum mechanics, which is very different than identical particles in classical physics, because classically, you can keep track of individual particles. In, cl in classical mechanics, you can just follow the trajectories or compute the trajectories of each particle, even if they're identical, and you know exactly where they are and where they're going. Individual particles. Okay, and the point is in quantum mechanics, that's impossible, even in principle. And so identical particles, and this is sort of a tautology in a way, identical particles are intrinsically in, indistinguishable. So the reason I say this is kind of a tautology is you could say, what do you mean by identical particle? And the answer would be, Two particles are identical if they are intrinsically indistinguishable. So maybe in, in a way it's sort of a definition. 
So in any case, for example, I could imagine doing a scattering experiment. And this scattering experiment has been done, of course, where I scatter two electrons, two identical particles. They don't actually have to be electrons. That's just the easiest one off of each other. OK, and so I have a picture where I send in one electron and another electron. And then there's some interaction that takes place, and I'm just going to draw a blob over it. And out comes an one electron and another electron. So something happened in there, but we're not sure what. And we'll call this particle, we'll call this electron one and this electron two, and this electron three and this electron four. So the point is, it has no meaning to say, Oh, electron three was really the same electron as electron one, because you could just as easily say that electron four is the same electron as electron one, or that electron three was the same electron as electron two. Whatever laws of physics we have have to take that into account. And so both, one way of saying it is both electrons that we've labeled three and four have equal claim to being the same as electrons one over two. So I'll put or two because it's true for both of them. So basically what we need to do is write down our equations in such a way that that, that that claim is true. Okay, so let's say that we don't have just two of them, let's call it N to be more general. So to describe a state with capital N identical particles, One thing we could do is write our state like this. We could take the tensor product of n identical Hilbert spaces so n identical ket spaces and so what should each uh, of these ket spaces look like. If I have an electron and I want to describe where it is, I can tell you its position. I'm writing a label one for electron one. And the other thing I would want to tell you is what its spin was. And all electrons have spin one half. So the really all I have to tell you is what direction its spin is pointing or what its Z component is, that would, that would completely specify the state. Right, so I could write a ket like that. And the meaning of this ket is that if, you, if your particle is in this state, you are certain to find uh, the electron, or more generally the particle, um, at position R1. With S sub Z, equals h bar times m1, right? And I don't need to tell you the orbital angular momentum because I've chosen a complete set of commuting observables, namely the position of the thing. So now I can do that for each one of my n particles, and I take a tensor product of them. So now I've got r2 and m2 and so on up until I get to r sub n and m sub n. OK, and now I've got a tensor product Hilbert space that completely describes everything for my n particles. And so as usual, we can just dispense with the tensor product complication and write a single cat for this. OK, and so I'm just going to write R1, M1, R2, 
M2, all the way up to Rn M sub N. Okay, or if I want to write an even more shorthand notation, I could just take all of the data for each one of the electrons, namely the position and the spin component, and just write it as a single label. Let me call it alpha. So I could write or alpha one, alpha two, up to alpha n, where you're supposed to, when you see alpha one, that means all of the data that's in R1 and M1. Okay, or maybe I don't want to specify the positions of the particles. Maybe I want to specify their angular, their ordinary momenta. So I could do that instead. Or maybe I'm doing all of this in a potential that's spherically symmetric. And so instead of the momentum or the position, I would have a principal quantum number and an orbital angular momentum quantum number and a Z component of the orbital angular momentum. I guess I should have called this M sub L1 and then my Z component of spin. Okay, so alpha is just some generic notation for the data that you specify the individual particle properties with. Okay, so here's the key point is we can label the particles, that's allowed. It's just that the answers to physical questions can't depend on our labeling. So we can label the identical particles. But answers to physical questions. For example, a physical question might be, what's the ground state energy? Or what's the first excited state energy? Or something like that. Uh, answers to physical questions can't depend on our choice of labeling. So this is a very powerful constraint on what we're allowed to write down and what we're not allowed to write down as far as um, observable quantities. So one thing it means is that any observable operator we write down I'm going to write Hermitian because we also know it has to be a Hermitian operator to be an observable. Any Hermitian observable operator must be symmetric under interchange of the labels. So by symmetric, what I really mean is unchanged. So if we switch labels. Oops. So if we go back up here to our imaginary scattering problem, it means I could have decided to label this electron in my figure by three and this one by four. But if I instead chose to call this one four and this one three, or if I interchange this label and that label, I have to get exactly the same answer. And therefore the operators that are observables that are things I can actually measure have to reflect that. And so they have to be unchanged if we switch the labels. So let's just say, for example, let's say I'm really interested in energies. My Hamiltonian for a bunch of identical free particles could be the following, P1 squared over 2M plus P2 squared over 2M plus dot, 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 plus Pn squared over 2M. Okay, but obviously the Ms have to be the same so that when I interchange the labels, I get the same thing back. That's just saying identical particles have to have the same mass. If they didn't have the same mass, they wouldn't be identical. 
but also I need them in this combination where I'm adding their squares together. So this would be true uh, if there was no potential. So maybe that's not that exciting, but let's suppose we add in a potential. What kind of potentials are we allowed to add in? Okay, so or, and here let's just for simplicity specialize to the case of two identical particles, like for the helium atom. So what could we write down that would be symmetric? We could write down the same kinetic term that we just did. And then we can write down a potential for the particle that we've decided to label one. So in general, that could depend on position in some very complicated way. But however it depends on position, the particle that we've decided to label two has to have exactly the same potential. Okay, so these must be the same. Otherwise, our particles are not identical. Now we can also add in another part of the potential that might look like this. Okay, it can depend on not just the individual positions, but on their difference. And then that function can be, that function V12 can be anything. Because if I interchange, um, if I interchange particle, the particle I've labeled one with the particle I've labeled two, then the magnitude of the difference doesn't change. And so this is symmetric. This term is symmetric under the interchange automatically, no matter what function V12 is. Okay, so that's, those are allowed Hamiltonians for two identical particles. This also applies to other things that you might wanna measure, like for example, momentum. So also applies to the momentum operator. And so here is your observable, observable momentum operator. It's just the sum of the ones for the individual labeled momenta, but the individual ones by themselves are not observables. And so you cannot measure, you cannot pick, if you've got identical electrons in principle, you can't pick out one of the electrons and say, I'm gonna measure just that electron's momentum, because in reality, what you're doing is you're, is since all the electrons are identical, you're measuring the, uh, the momentum of the total or nothing at all. Okay, so the individual P's aren't, a, aren't observables. Now, with that said, in many, many cases, you can construct observables that are approximately the momentum of one electron or another. For example, if one of my electrons uh, that I'm describing is bound to an atom on Pluto, then to a very good approximation, I can ignore that and just deal with the one here on Earth. But in principle, the, this is the observable, the sum of them. Um, another thing you can do is you can talk about the density operator for identical particles. So if I'm talking about what's the density per unit volume, uh, I'm going to write this as R. Okay, I want to emphasize this little R that I've written here is not a position operator. Let me explain that by saying this is the sum of delta functions. I guess I'll make them three dimensional delta functions of R minus Ri. Okay, so what is r, little r here? Little r is a vector that labels which operator I'm talking about. Okay, so it's just saying, if I want to know what is the density of particles at some position, this is the operator that does it. And the r sub i, are the individual 
position operators. They are perfectly good operators, it's just that they're not observables. Okay, for my n particles. All right, so those are examples of observables. Next time we're going to continue along these lines by talking about what are allowed states that have to satisfy the permutation properties. So next time we will do states and we'll start by doing states by figuring out how they, how they behave under permutations. So that means if we exchange two particles, what happens to the state? And somewhat surprisingly, it can be not just symmetric, it could be anti-symmetric. All right, so we will do that next time. And let me ask if there are any questions on today's lecture. All right, well, if not, then I will see you all on Monday. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Okay, Thank have you. a good weekend. Thank you so much. Professor? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so I, I finished question one as well. It's just one small thing remained uh, from last night. Like, yeah, the only thing I'm not finished with is two, but when I finished question one last night, um, it's just like um, that one part where you were asking, okay, which end integer does the best job and how does it compare with the exact answer? I think I did this wrong. Um, do you have a moment to look at my response? Um, sure. Were you going to share a screen or were you going to send it to me? Oh, I sent it already. I sent it last night. Sorry about that. You sent it last night? Yeah, I sent it. Yeah, you got homework for, didn't you? Uh, I oh, sent it. oh, right. Yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't look at it. Where is it? Sorry, okay, what should I be looking at? Uh, question one. Okay. Hey, uh, I'm looking at, like, okay, so are my answers off for C, D, and E? For C, D, and E. Um. So it's hard for me to tell. One reason is because what you're supposed to do is, is uh, minimize with respect to K. And so you shouldn't be getting a sum of, of things that depend on K in different ways. You should just be getting a number that only depends on, on omega. Really? Right. K. K is your variational parameter. You're supposed to have minimized with respect to K. I did that. Oh, shoot. You know what it is? I substituted in that original from A instead of what I got in B. So I did that wrong. Right. Oh, man. But is my answer to be correct or is that kind of off too? Um, for B, I'm not finding B. It's oh wait, I see it, okay. Um, is that correct? Um, It's hard for me to tell right away. Let's see. 
See, that's one of the risks. I think that was why I chose the next one because I thought that was too much. <laughs> <laughs> so um it can if it's correct it needs to be simplified let me put it that way uh. so yeah the, the correct answer in the simplest form is is uh i believe much simpler than that I don't know where I went. Did I go? Hmm? At least it has the right units, apparently. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it at least has the right units. <laughs> so, um, wouldn't it be better if I just let this go for now? I did want to go over question two for myself. And I think that might just take no long, longer than an hour or so. Okay. I don't know. So I, I guess I would say B without, uh, I don't see anything obviously wrong with B, but I'm yeah. not, I can't tell you that it's, that it's correct either because the simplified form is much simpler than that. Yeah, I was kind but, of terrified by that. That's why I used the response for A to respond to C, D, and E. See what I did? Right, but that's not going to help you because to find <laughs> the energy of these states, you want something specific that depend that doesn't depend on K. K is just a variational parameter. Mm -hmm. And so you always, in the variational principle, you're always going to replace your variational parameters by the things that actually give you the minimum. And so really you have two variational parameters. You have K and N. And so you're going to be plugging them in and you're also doing it for specific values of L, right? So in the end, your, your final best answer, well, you're doing it for different values of N, but your final best answer shouldn't depend on K or N or L for, well, L is being fixed for that matter. Yeah. Was my K correct? Um, your K is possibly correct. Let's see. Uh, It's um, actually, I think it's not quite correct. That's probably why. Yeah, I think the uh, I think that you've got a fourth root, which is correct, and you've got a numerator there, which looks like it's possibly correct, but the denominator is is uh, not quite right, I believe. Hmm. I don't know. Should I just like submit this as is? Because I don't know if I have time to go back on this. I yeah, think... it, might, it might be a good idea to cut your losses at this point, just because then there's another homework set that's coming due and then, and then there's the midterm. So at some point, yeah. And it's just math. I mean, I got the concept basically. I figured out what what it's about. I just didn't do the math right. But what about number two? Should I just finish that one and turn it in, or you think I should let that one go too? Um, that was just a small mistake I did on that one. And yeah. I already got part C done. Oh yeah, could you please look at part C? Did I answer that one correctly for number two? Um. What was number two asking? Sorry, I have to. So on part C, you're supposed to give a number. Yeah. So you've given me symbols. You've given me a rid. You've given me things written in terms of Rydbergs and fine structure constants. But well, I want a number in terms of electron volts. 
So it's it that should be pretty easy to do, right? You just well, how do I know? Is that was that in the notes with the alpha and the e and the a naught and the but isn't that like what is that the sigma l zero? Delta L zero is the Kronecker delta, which just says it's zero. It's zero unless L equals zero, and then it's one. Okay. Well, that doesn't play a role in the calculations, does it? So well, all we need is just the alpha and the e and the a naught, correct? That's correct. Were those in the notes? Sure. Oh, okay. So I have to go back and okay. And then, like, how does the result scale with the nuclear charge Z for hydrogen? Like, I have, let's just put a quick note in there. I think that's wrong too, right? Um, <laughs> so, so what you're supposed to do there is go back in the notes mm -hmm. and find out how the parameters of the hydrogen atom solution depend on Z. And so, there's actually, if you go back in the hydrogen atom chapter, there's some. I uh, believe it's a footnote, but I won't swear to it. It might be a, just a, co a parenthetical comment in the text, which says, how do, how do things change when Z changes? And so basically, things the get one on, by some power of Z. The one on page 203, is that the one you were referring to? Uh, maybe. 203. Um, no, that's just, uh, that's just saying that, you know, that's just saying that Z exists. I meant in the hydrogen atom chapter itself somewhere. Um, Well, are parts A and B of number two time consuming from like I did most of A, I think, right? Um, I think so. I think problem two should probably be much easier to fix. So should I just fix that one and turn it in? Um, I think that might be good advice. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, in, in that case, could I just request the 5% to be taken off question two? Um, because the rest of it, I'm not changing. I mean, I already did three. I already did one. Or would you take 5% off all of it? I think 5% off all of it because I, I don't want to get in the habit of accepting parts of homework solutions because it becomes a bookkeeping nightmare for me. Oh, I see. Right. Well, in that case, would it be more ideal for me to just leave it as is or no? Um, that's up to you. I, I don't know. I don't know how many points number two is anyways. Well, each problem is 10 points. So 5% would be how many points? 5% of the total would be uh, basically two points on the whole thing. Okay. Right, well, well, thank you. For, so in case I don't turn it in, you'll just accept the one I already submitted, correct? Yeah. So if you, I don't, if I don't hear from you by say tomorrow, then I'll assume that this is the current one. Okay. But what you would advise to just do two and leave one, correct? Uh, I think that's my best advice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, professor. Okay. Take care. Have a good day.